we'll start now dr sunit is it okay 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 now a very good evening to all of you and warm welcome to all the participants who have joined today i'm dr priyanti who's a moderator for this evening without further ado let me introduce dr sunit rajwasan who is a renowned family physician with an experience of over a decade in the field of family medicine he is currently working for the ent unit of kalambu south teaching hospital kalaburi dr sunit rajwasan is not only the director of the family clinic private limited which is telehealth initiative providing quality sri lankan primary health care to expertise clients all over the world but is also the secretary examiner and a mentor for the ncgp board i warm welcome to you sir and i thank you for your presence today here over to you sir to address the participant right thank you priyanti for those kind words just a small clarification there i've been a gp for about 6 to 7 years but i've been working for over a decade in the ent for, for ent at kalubovil and before that at mongrama so i'm coming to you with almost 13 to 14 plus years of ent experience um it's become my bread and butter now and uh, it's interesting to have a gp's perspective of things because um, uh, ent is a super speciality and as with i and so on and so forth so it's it's uh, rare to um, uh, it's it's uh, the, one of the reasons i do the lectures for the ncgp also it's simply because it's very rare to um, get someone to summarize ent issues from a gp's point of view because most often when we are given lectures we are given lectures by ent surgeons and ent surgeons will go the entire length of describing to you uh, management and and uh, basically uh, uh, content that may be beyond what a gp should know so what i have for you is if i may share my uh, screen hold on um right i hope everyone can see my screen yes can see sir right okay so what i have for you is ideally what is a 3 hour lecture that i do for the ncgp candidates which i will summarize in one with um, to the best of my ability go through the very bare bare basics that we as gps need to know i would like this to be interactive i would like you all to please ask me questions stop me at any point clarify anything you need uh, i don't want this to be a one way lecture where i just keep talking so i would love to hear your your voices too or your concerns if you think i may have said something wrong please bring it up and we can we can uh, discuss it um so i let's let's just quickly go through um i would like to take about maybe 20 minutes each for the year nose and throat um so let let me start with the commonest things that we see in our gp setup uh, at the start but go with the foreign bodies that may come to you Foreign bodies are very interesting because you, you commonly get these cases uh, when you get uh, foreign bodies in the ear, the nose and the throat. So uh, let's just first discuss some uh, foreign bodies in the ear. Very commonly, you get patients who uh, you know come to you, mostly young kids. You, you know, kids tend to put anything and everything they find into any and every orifice they have, and when it comes to either the ear, the nose, or the nose, they come to you. so it's important to understand that uh, most of these ear foreign bodies aren't emergencies but the parents might be a bit concerned they might come to you saying bye we la saying but the name of that agaram upata karanne worse yet the parents might come to you um having tried to remove something they put in and cause more damage than they or than what is already there so um remember anything any any plastic object these beads spherical objects uh, metal even even uh, pebbles they are fairly safe if you have the facility to wash out foreign bodies in your gp practice in a practice that we call syringing it's very simple all you need is a kidney tray and a syringe so if you have this even uh, you can simply use a 50 cc syringe and a needle with a tip broken off You just simply pump saline along the posterior canal of the or posterior wall, wall of the ear canal and catch out whatever debris that comes out with your kidney tray. You can easily remove this. If syringing fails, of course, you might need to. Uh, the next step would be not to take it out yourself. Ideally, at this point, it's best to send to an ENT surgeon or an ENT clinic of the nearest hospital, and we will sort this out for you. Uh, it's okay to leave a. Uh, uh, 
non an, an inorganic foreign body in the ear for a day or two it's not a life threatening emergency and it's okay if it is seen in a clinic a day or two later patients might ask this they may be anxious they may say remove this immediately but that is not the case uh, the picture you see on your on your right hand side is with canal inflammation as well that's what happens when a foreign body can irritate the canal if it's left there for a while so this again uh, it's very difficult to remove this foreign body in your clinic such a situation it would require you to send to an ent surgeon or an ent clinic now the the one the other the, the the other interesting foreign body you get in your ears is the live objects or the animate objects like and very commonly you find um insects now we get insects that go into ears very commonly with, it's very common with uh, motorbike riders who wear their when they wear their helmet especially if it's an open face helmet insects tend to fly in from either side and uh, go through the gang going to their ears and also at night we had they recently had a case just 2 3 weeks back 2 3 days ago where this young 90 year old boy came with a cockroach that had crawled into his ear at night so uh, it's important to remember here that um, insects don't have a reverse they can't in the passive passive in the their in name simple thing is so uh, they try to crawl through and through inside they're not going to go through the tympanic membrane they're not going to enter your middle ear but what's going to do is they are going to wedge themselves especially as you see with the cockroach on the left they have these spiky um, appendages on their on their feet on their legs and those get stuck in the ear canal and they may not be able to remove themselves and what you see on your right is actually a tick a tick that has drunk blood and those are the tick feces the the, the what the uh, what the tick has put out that you see marked as b so um live objects also what you can do in the clinic is first and foremost it's very very important to kill the insect because the insect is, is maybe wriggling around squirming around causing the patient a great degree of pain so when that happens it's always best to pour some you can use olive oil even coconut oil or even water oil is better but even water even saline is fine saline is also anything as long as it's not uh, not uh, Uh, any any liquid basically is fine just pour it into the ear and leave it for a good 5 to 10 minutes and that will kill the animal like that is relieve the immediate distress or the pain that the patient is under afterwards if it is visible to your naked eye if you can simply use a forceps and gently remove the insect out of out of the uh, out of the ear canal especially if it's a cockroach or a moth or a bigger or a bigger insect sometimes insect come out piece by piece if so there's anything stuck deeper in your um, ear canal and this is a very important point especially with ticks also whatever you feel like whenever you feel like you can't remove something out of the ear you can't do some sort of instrumentation into the ear my advice to you is try not to be heroic try not to um experiment or or be rather adventurous because you might cause more harm than good in case because you might rupture the tympanic membrane that's the danger so what you can remove you can remove but you can't remove again send to us send to ent and we will sort it out interesting point with ticks um, when ticks uh, generally they tend to crawl right up to the tympanic membrane and they bite the tympanic membrane they will drink blood and they will either perish or when you put um, oil or water into the ticks they will die so when they do die um, and when you remove them their jaws get locked around the tympanic membrane. so when you remove the tick a piece of the tympanic membrane comes out so in such patients you have to advise them always to keep their ears very dry until the perforation heals there is no treatment for a perforation please remember this for any type of acute perforation the only treatment is to keep the ear absolutely dry you shouldn't let any any water or any liquid enter the ear not even ear drops a lot of gps i see uh, prescribe ear drops for perforations for acute perforations not ear infections i deal with that topic in a little while um just remember a dry ear is an ear that's going to heal by itself ideally within 6 to 8 weeks a perforation will heal so moving on please at any point if you have any questions please stop me and ask i have put a slide in there but another important ear for anybody is uh, batteries a lot of kids tend to kids dismantle anything and everything they get their hands on and um, they will also um, <clears throat> they will also dismantle their toys or watch and, and put these watch batteries this batteries into their ears 
disc batteries are an acute severe emergency. If you get a patient with a disc battery in their ear, don't even remove it by yourself. Immediately send to the emergency of the nearest hospital, and we will uh, we will attend to it and remove it. It is an emergency that requires rapid sequence anesthesia. We don't even wait six hours until fasting is complete. Uh, we remove immediately. Asara, as for your question to is whether this is okay to put uh, put lignocaine for live foreign bodies, uh, we do do that sometimes when it gets into the inner ear. Um, but we can use Emla, the anesthetic cream. I actually used that recently to remove an ant uh, out of an ear. Just uh, that we do in the, in the clinic. I mean, if you have the tools to do it in your GP practice, I would say you go ahead. But I, it's unlikely because most of these specialist tools we only have in our clinics, not even with the consultants in the, in the, in the private practice. So um, more than lignocaine spray or liquid lignocaine, I would prefer lignocaine cream or emla, which you can just simply squeeze into the air, leave for a bit, and then suck it out with the foreign body also. Next, I'll go into uh, foreign bodies you find in your nose. Now, again, nasal foreign bodies are common in kids. Like I said, kids like to explore every orifice in their body with whatever they find at home. Um, Remember, a very important uh, take-home point here is unilateral nasal discharge, unless proven otherwise, is always, always due to a foreign body in the nose. Nasal discharge is always bilateral. It's only unilateral when there's a reactive discharge due to something they put in their nose. Now, you see the typical picture as you, as you inspect. I mean, you don't even need to put an anterior uh, speculum. You can just lift up the nose and see, as you see in this child, you'll see it there. Now, removing these foreign bodies, remember these also can be most commonly they are, they are, they are either they're shiny spherical objects they put into the nose. Um, most of the time, if you have a tool like you see on the right hand side, what we call a foreign body hook, or it's called a, it's also called a Jobson horn probe. Um, the, I, the, the, the technique here is to get behind the foreign body. What we do is we navigate behind the foreign body and we, with, with, with this hook like uh, probe you see, and we pull it out. We can't grip a nasal foreign body with a forcep or, a, or you know, like a, a crocodile forcep or any sort of tweezer of those sorts because we will only push it deeper and deeper. And always remember, again, um, my advice to you is do not be adventurous with foreign bodies. If you grip this and you fail to grip it and it gets pushed further back, you're going to end up at one point dropping it into the nasopharynx. And from the nasopharynx, it will enter the oropharynx and you're going to end up with aspiration. So that is dangerous. If you can't remove it with one or two attempts, and if it's disappearing from your view, send to ENT and we will sort this out for you. Also remember, uh, uh, what I said one more time, I'm going to repeat that, a unilateral one-sided nasal discharge. Even if the mother doesn't tell you and just brings a child with any other complaint and you see this child is leaking thick phlegm or thick hotu from only one nostril, always suspect that there is a foreign body. Okay, and again, it's very important, nasal foreign bodies, um, batteries. This, that's another huge issue we have with nasal foreign bodies. Also, same problem, disc batteries or watch batteries. Here you see a uh, disc battery some sandwich between the turbinate and the septum in the nose. Again, this is an acute severe emergency. On your right hand, you see what happens when we leave it for a few hours, the battery discharges and burns the septum, burns the mucosa. It will burn through the cartilage. And if you leave it for any longer, even a few hours, you're gonna end up with what we call a saddle nose deformity. As I lecture to my candidates, what I always say is, uh, this is what, what we tell kids, you wanna end up looking like Voldemort from Harry Potter. You're gonna, you, this is what will happen if you keep a battery in your nose. This is Voldemort from Harry Potter has a very typical saddle nose deformity. And this is a, it's a very good example that I use what can happen. And how, this is how I use this to stress upon how urgent it is to remove batteries from a nasal cavity or even from any disc batteries. Right, and third, we will get to foreign bodies in the throat. These are also more common in uh, adults. And adults, of course, um, um, you have two types of uh, foreign body. These are um, very commonly, you see, coins and bones. Bones, of course, more, more in adults with fish and chicken and whatever, whatever else they eat. Coins, again, with children. So um, when it comes to fish bones or bones, um, they can get stuck at various points in the throat. 
Um, if it is visible to your naked eye, you can always attempt removal. It's very easy. It can be done easily if you have a tongue depressor. A tongue depressor is something we all have in our clinics and a pair of tweezers, uh, forceps. Um, what you see here is a fish bone stuck in a tonsil. And if it is in the tonsil pillars or the tonsil itself, soft palate, you can very simply depress with a tongue depressor and remove the foreign body. You can go with a lignocaine spray beforehand, but uh, I mean, with practice, it, even that is not necessary. Again, um, there are various types of bones that can, I mean, uh, uh, there are various types. Um, patients, what I'm trying to say is patients can present in different ways. Here's what we need to understand. A fish bone is not going to stay in a throat for days and days or weeks and weeks. Because sometimes if patients come to you and say, Dr. Malukatta Kanuna, then Sumana the Kapita Venava, then Masaya Pita Venava, Tamata Kavanakati Terenava. Here you can always, I mean, rule out that this may, I mean, rule out the fact that the bone can still be there. Because if a fish bone gets stuck and it gets left behind, it will only take 48 to 72 hours for this bone to get for the uh, tonsillar bed or the piriform fossa or wherever it is stuck, the surrounding area to get inflamed, infected, and, and cause severe obstruction and pain to the patient. Such patients won't last three, four days. They will come to you or they'll go straight to hospital to the emergency, drooling saliva, not, not able to swallow their own saliva. I mean, with fever, they will, they will have constitutional symptoms. They will be severely toxically ill. So a fishbone is not going to cause that much trouble. Again, what you need to understand is there are, I mean, there are two types of bones here we commonly see, calcified ones and non-calcified ones. In, 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 in Sarala Singhala, um, Podimalu, like Saleo, uh, uh, you know, Saleo, Hurullo, small fish, they, their bones aren't calcified. So those bones, even the tonsils will digest over time. They will dissolve them over time and they turn into sludge and they just get uh, swallowed away. Larger bones like Balaya, Kelawalla or chicken, pork, beef bones, they of course have calcium. They are stronger, bigger bones. They will cause severe symptoms and they need to be removed. So if it is again visible to the naked eye, you can remove as I've shown in the picture. If it is not, there are a couple of very simple tests that you can do to assess how badly symptomatic the patient is. One is check for neck tenderness. Always ask the patient to point to where you, where he or she feels the pain. They will always point to a point in the, in the, in the throat and say, Dr. Metanary, then. The next thing is you ask them to do is just press upon that point. Press upon that point with your thumb. Hold their neck. Press upon that point with their thumb. While pressing, ask them to swallow. We call this a swallowing test, right? If they can swallow, then highly unlikely the bone is still stuck. But once, but if the bone is still stuck in their throat and you ask them to swallow while pressing their neck, they will not be able to swallow. They will be in severe pain, they will gag and they will cough and they will have issues. This is a very clear indicator that yes, there is a bone in the throat. So um, in such a case, like I said, if it's not visible to your naked eye, Sent to ENT, we will admit them and we will, under anesthesia or under fiber optic guidance, we will remove the bones. Um, similarly, like I said, it's up to us to clinically understand which patients have urgently need this and which patients don't. And it's okay if you miss a diagnosis on a fish bone. It's not easy. I mean, I've seen hundreds of fish bone patients and sometimes once in a while, even I may think a patient may not have or a patient may. The important thing here is to review the patient. If you feel that the patient does not have a fish bone um, stuck acutely and it's just having symptoms of the uh, injury the bone could have caused by going down, give some antibiotics, give some steroids depending on the diabetic status and review them in about three days time. Explain to them that a wound in the throat caused by a fish bone going down is going to get irritated every time you swallow. I mean, you can practically think about this yourself. Right? And it's, um, it's going to feel like there's something stuck there. It's not like a wound anywhere else in the body. A wound any, any, in, on any exposed surface of your body, uh, you allow it time to heal. You will cover it with a plaster and it, it is not disturbed. Your throat gets disturbed every second of every day, even during sleep. You swallow saliva, you speak, you eat, you do various other things in your life that include your throat. Um, it gets disturbed all the time. So... It is going to, I mean, it's, it doesn't allow that injury adequate space and time to heal. So your, this patient is going to feel this foreign body sensation for about a week, even though the bone is not there. This is very important to explain to the patient, even after removal of a fish bone, 
look, this doesn't mean that you'll miraculously be fine from now on. This hurt, this pain will be there for a couple of days, but it will go away. It will reduce. I'm giving you medication for it to, to reduce inflammation, to combat the infection if there is one, and you'll be better in two, three days' time. If you're not, come back and see me. Then you start suspecting whether there's actually a bone structure or not. Another helpful tool for diagnosis is, of course, an X-ray. Now, if you look at this X-ray, um, <clears throat> you actually may not be able to make out the fish bone. There is a bone in this X-ray, but uh, it is it is in. Um, I wonder whether you can see this. It is. Um, I, I purposefully use this X-ray simply because, although this 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 uh, X-ray has a fish bone stuck <laughs> in, in it, you can't see it. You can't see it clearly. Again, because this bone didn't have calcium, but there are other symptoms you can look for an X-ray. Firstly, you will see that the cervical spine is straightened. Cervical spine gets straightened because of the pain and the swelling in the neck area that is causing the paraspinal muscles to go into spasm, and that will cause a straightening of the cervical spine. Secondly, look at the gap between the trachea and the vertebra, that is where the esophagus is, and that space has got slightly piriform or pear shape. Because the, the trachea has got pushed anteriorly very slightly. That is a very early developing signs of inflammation. The bone itself is actually behind the larynx. Behind, it's, it's, it should be in the piriform fossa. There's a very slight sliver of evidence of a bone there, but it's, you can't make it out of the naked eye. But the reason I use this X-ray is to look for the other symptoms of a foreign body in the neck that you can diagnose on an X-ray. It's not just the bone. Don't just look for a bone. And bone like an acula, don't think that there is no issue for the patient. There can be issues. Always go with your clinical acumen also, not simply the fact that there's a bone there or not. Like I said, we are a little pressed for time to cover everything in the ear, nose, and throat. So I'll just run past a few things. Coins, again, are very common with kids. Uh, those of you who deal with kids or who work in Lady Ridge Way uh, will, would have seen this very commonly. Um, children, again, again, I repeat, they love to take a bite out of everything they find um, <clears throat> and <coughs> sorry so these two x-rays are used to um, it, to uh, demonstrate to you the commonest point where a coin will get stuck and that would be your upper esophageal sphincter mind you um, only the x-ray on the left is the coin in the esophagus right? in the x-ray on the right it's in the trachea it's very very important to make out the difference between these two because one of them is a life-threatening emergency the other, of course, is not. So we'll first deal with the X-ray on the left. That is your coin stuck in the esophagus. If you look at the AP X-ray, the coin is in, uh, I mean, on its, uh, it's, 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 it's showing face first because the esophagus is a compressed tube and it's compressed anteroposterior. So the coin stuck in it will show its face to you on an AP X-ray and it will show its profile or the side to you on a lateral X-ray. Then you know you're safe, you know it's stuck and it's not going to cause any life-threatening harm. Now, there are different schools of thought as to how to deal with this. Certainly, uh, some ENT surgeons uh, would like to observe, actually, we give the, um, give the child some, uh, any, any carbonated beverage, like Coke or Fanta, just a sip or two of Coke or Fanta to drink, because the carbon dioxide coming out, the fizz from that drink, will help to navigate this past the upper esophageal sphincter. And this is the toughest place to navigate for a coin. Once it navigates past this, the cardiac sphincter, the pylorus, they are nothing. Will, this coin will go past and come out the other end, causing no issues about a couple of days later. Um, <clears throat> the other X-ray, the one on the right, of course, that, as you can see, on an AP view, the coin is showing you its profile. Uh, this is, and, and, and on a lateral view, the coin is showing you its surface. This is a coin stuck in the glottis. Why is this, the, why is this at uh, perpendicular angles to the X-ray on your left is because um, your glottis, your vocal cords face, face forwards. And when a coin gets stuck between the vocal cords, it's going to fall directly between them and be stuck in a profile view on an AP X-ray, like, just like the X-ray on the right. That is an emergency. Even though it's stuck there, the patient may be able to breathe normally or may not have any symptoms, but at any point, this coin can shift its orientation and close off the glottis. Even a millimeter's move can do that. This requires immediate removal. Now, just going back to the coin, coin in the esophagus, if it's like, like I said, if you give it, a, you give a bit of coke and see if it goes down, take a repeat x-ray and see. Um, if, it has a, if it hasn't moved, we remove this under anesthesia. If it has moved, we generally keep them under observation until it comes out the other end. 
we never had a situation so far in the last 13 years of my practice where we had to open up a stomach for a gun and take out the coin. They generally come out the other end. <clears throat> this is, of course, a little beyond what we need to know as GPs. What we need to know is a point of reference and the investigation and how to brief our patients. I mean, basically, allay the mother's or the father's fears. Because it's things like this that make the parents go ballistic. They, they go nuts. They will come to you, start crying. I mean, they will neglect their child until this happens. But as soon as this happens, you are on the firing range because they come to you and an aid of the Aragona, Mekaguna, and all of that. And you're on the firing line. So as long as you do right by your patient and you lay their fears and explain to them what's going to happen next, you've done your job. There's no harm in referring these patients to ENT because at the end of the day, they will remember that you acted timely and did the right thing at the right time. Right, moving on. Next, I will deal, I will quickly deal with wax because wax is a very common thing we see in ENT. And I would like to, to have a good idea of uh, how to deal with wax very briefly. So um, wax, I'll just go back to the previous slide, I'm sorry. Um, wax is a naturally occurring thing. It is just the ceruminous glands of the ear, coating the ear and keeping the ear canals smooth so that uh, sound waves carry more smoothly and through more laminar flow towards the tympanic membrane. Now wax can be different colors. That's why I had this chart here. Wax can be anywhere from black to red to yellow, uh, any, any of these colors, actually any color under the sun, wax, is, uh, wax can be various, various colors and easily commonly confused with blood clots in the ear also. Now, uh, just a few things about wax. We don't have to clean our ears, but we all love doing it, right? And we are all hypocrites if you ask our patients not to use cotton buds, because I'm sure if I asked a lot of you, how many of you use cotton buds, I'd be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't. Let's, let's be honest, even I do, right? But what we need to advise them is, one is, you don't need to clean your ears. Your ears are self-cleaning. They clean themselves. And we are only making things worse by using cotton buds. As you see in the picture on the left, when we put a cotton bud inside, we do three things. One is we compact the wax into a ball of wax, and that will completely block off the ear. Two, we interrupt the, uh, uh, the, the hair cells inside the ear canal, which bring the wax out naturally by itself. And the natural process of wax removal also stop. Three, we insert infections into the uh, fungal infections through the cotton on the cotton bud uh, by doing this. If, what you can advise your patients and what I can ask you to do as well is to roll up a piece of tissue, put that in your ear and scratch. That will not damage the tympanic membrane, that will not interrupt the natural flow of wax. So at least two of the three things that you can damage, 66% 6, of the damage you can cause by using cotton buds can be allayed by using a rolled up piece of tissue. Please tell this to your patients. Second thing is, here's what wax looks like on an oroscope. Um, it can be few pieces like on the left hand side or it can be a completely obstructing ball of wax like on the right hand side. Um, it's quite simple to treat for wax. We use um, <clears throat> uh, wax can be quite hard. It can be, I mean, it can be rock hard. And I would suggest you not try to remove wax through instrumentation at the very first uh, visit unless you are fairly confident that the wax has softened. Patients may not directly come and complain to you saying, Dr. Kane wax, you know, that's not what they say. They will come and say, I'll tell you the typical presentation. You get this in very commonly in young adults, maybe 25 to 35 years of age. They'll come to you and say, Doctor, we went for a party. I went to, I had a dip in the pool. Nange neva, mude neva. Neva ta passe kanak block, batura gila doctor. Hita ganda vaya, mukadda gara nikla, rita neva hari yata, hari kakkumai, koda bala. They will not directly link this to wax. But what's happening here is, um, wax is hydrophilic. Wax soaks up water like a sponge. And uh, when enough water gets into the air, typically it's a CC bath, um, the, the wax soaks up the water, expands in your ear canal, and compresses the ear canal skin against the bone, uh, against the mastoid bone. This is acute, severely painful. And this will further obstruct the passage of sound also. They will also say, they think the water is what's causing the ear block. So when you inspect, you will see that there is a semi-solid, partially dissolved, smelly, thick, black substance that is wax. Again, very simple, can be treated through you. Uh, start these patients on so, uh, docusate sodium or soda bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate drops. 
there are a number of uh, drops in the market. I can name the five brands that are only five brands in the market. There is Molsa, Vaxol, Vaxout, and um, Molsa, Vaxol, Vaxout, and there's one more. If it comes to my mind, I'll tell you there are four actually. Um, all of this is simply sodium bicarbonate. You need to ask this patient to put as much soda bicarbonate into their ear as possible. Not two drops, not three drops, and ear full. What I tell them is, and they answer, khana utha wala, khana pire na daan. Yindu dahayak pahala wala. That is like, you, they'll go through two, three bottles in that, in that span of one week that you treat them. So put as many, as much sodium bicarbonate as you can, twice, four, five times a day to the ear. Give the wax about a week to dissolve. Get them back. If you practice syringe in your clinic, you can syringe it out. If not, simply send to us after a week's time and we will clean the ear for you. Uh, just using sodium bicarbonate is not adequate. You need to remove the wax also, and that is done to syringing or using a vacuum sucker. Um, we generally don't go for syringing in case there is a history of previous ear infection. Please ask this of your patients before you syringe for any reason. And uh, syringing is not a practice that we do for infected ears. I know this is done commonly by a number of people, but please, I beg you for the love of all that is holy, don't put water into an infected ear. You're going to make things worse. Remember that message from me. Keep the infected ears as dry as possible. Even if it's a dry ear with a tympanic perforation, you're going to introduce an infection by using water. The syringe ear that you're confident is that where the drum is intact. Generally, young adults who have had no previous history of any trauma or infection, you can safely syringe or send to us and we will clean. That's all about wax. Please, if any questions, please stop me, ask me, and I will go through them. I'm just running through the basics that I think is important for you. We'll deal with injuries and infections next. Um, <clears throat> I do speak fast, so um, if any of you need me to recap something or just want me to just go slow <laughs> again please reach out speak to me right let's deal with the common injuries first um so here i want to run through the two most common the commonest injuries you will find in ent um one is your nasal bone fracture and the other is your eardrum or the tympanic membrane perforation so nasal bone fractures happen generally after a fight and uh, i can tell you i've only met one man who actually came and told me sir guti can a sir and uh, I do not. Everyone else tries to break up a fight. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going But anyway, after the assault, they'll come to you. And the image on your left is a typical example of a nasal bone fracture where there is a deformity. Now, um, the nasal bone, a few important points you need to remember as G. One is, Fracturing a nasal bone doesn't necessarily mean there will be a nasal bone deformity. You may see a nasal bone fracture on a nasal bone uh, x-ray, but I'm sorry, I don't have an, a picture of an x-ray to show you. Hold on, hold on. Ah, there it is. I'm sorry, there it is. So a nasal bone fracture, like I said, just simply because a nasal bone is fractured, it does not mean that um, there will be a deformity. The x-ray on your left is a fractured nasal bone where the nasal bone, the superstructure is intact. You will see the fracture line, but uh, there is no deformity. But the X-ray on your right, you can see clearly the nasal bone is in two pieces, and most likely it may have it, it may have been sorry, hold on, it may have been um, there may have been overlying deformity also. Now, um, in a nasal bone fracture, in an assault or a trauma with nasal bone fracture, the second important thing you need to remember is to look for the most dangerous sign of all, and that is a sorry, hold on. The slides are going all over the place today. There you go. That is a septal hematoma. Now, a septal hematoma is a blood clot that, that strips the mucosa from the nasal septum and occupies both sides of the nasal septum. As you can see from two arrows, you look from anterior, you look from just on your, in, in, through the naked eye with a speculum, you will see that there is a tender, boggy swelling. If you poke this swelling, it's boggy. Um, swelling on both sides, a pear-shaped swelling, very form swelling on both sides of the nasal septum. A septal hematoma is an emergency. For the same reason, a disc battery is an emergency. This needs to be drained immediately as soon as possible because if you leave this behind, the degrading clot will also digest the cartilage of the nasal septum and 
again end up with a saddle nose deformity. So that is the only emergency issue that you have with the nasal bone fracture. Otherwise, nasal bone fractures are fairly benign and they can be set right by a simple surgery, a manipulation under anesthesia or an MUA of the nose. So for that, you send the patient to us and we sort it out for you. Again, what you need to explain to the patient is um, a few points. One, if this happened from an assault, this is grievous hurt. No matter how small the, small the bone is, fracturing a bone counts as barapatala hani or grievous hurt and, uh, as, as far as the medical legal aspects are concerned. Two is um, having a physical deformity like this is not going to cause any sort of functional deformity or airflow comp compromise to the patient because this does not affect the nasal septum. Remember, uh, for the septum to fracture, for the septum, not the nasal bone, for the septum on the inside to fracture, you need to have a significant impact on your face. For example, from an RPA or from a severe injury from, uh, from an accident, for the septum to be fractured and those patients are not going to walk into your clinic, they are going to waltz their way to the emergency or into the mall, one or the other. They're not going to survive an impact as strong as that. So what I'm going to tell you is they're not going to, they will have these questions for you. Whether will I, will I be able to breathe? Make a matter of and pass a question at either. No, it's not going to cause, if, you, if they didn't have an uh, obstruction already, it's not going to cause an obstruction, obst obstruction in the future. Um, also, uh, the cosmetic deformity needs to be set right within a week or 10 days of the fracture happening, because if not, this bone will set like this. And then if they decide that they want to do surgery six months or one year down the line, because then you need to go for a plastic surgery. Plastic surgery is a cosmetic surgery. It is not covered by insurance. It's going to cost them at least about half a million to 700,000 rupees to get this done in the private sector. In the state sector, yes, they'll do it, but then over a year's waiting list. Kalabu has a 14 month waiting list for rhinoplasties because they do it in our list. So that is how difficult it is to get a rhinoplasty or a nose job done in Sri Lanka. So such patients, you always need to give them this option because they may feel like Mata Meka Dang Hadagan no Minaha, I can do this later and put this off because it's not causing any physical, uh, any functional deformity. But cosmesis is very, very important to all of us. And although they may not think of it at the point, it may be too late when they do start to think of correcting their deformity. So this is what you need to explain to your patient, the pros and cons of why surgery is needed to set this straight. And doing a surgery within those 10 days is, 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 a, is, is a walk in the park. It's a piece of cake. Under anesthesia, we just push the nose with our thumbs back in the right place. Maybe use a septal forcep. It's just a 30 second to one minute procedure. Very simple thing to do. Right. There is a question. One second. No, you don't need to. I'm sorry, Hassan. I, I just saw this. You don't need to refer the patient if the nasal bone fracture is undisplaced. But do remember, um, you are getting yourself involved in a legal, um, uh, a bit of bit of a legal issue here. Because if it's an assault, if it's some sort of JMO case, it's always better to have the documentation to a state hospital, or you will be called to give evidence. But if the patient is not pressing charges, or if it's just an accident, you fall, then of course there is no need to refer the patient if there is no. Uh, physical deformity. Right. <clears throat> I'm assuming it's Hasara. I'm sorry if it's a Hasara. I'm so sorry. <laughs> My apologies. It's Hasara. It's Hasara. Okay, okay. All right. I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> right. Next, I move on to the uh, ear injuries. Again, as GPs, it is paramount, the utmost important that we are able to recognize injuries in the tympanic membrane and treat them accordingly. Um, I think I touched on this a little earlier. The treatment is no treatment. We leave these things alone. The commonest times you'll see this is um, when they come after being assaulted. Very common in domestic violence. Um, please keep an eye out for this because the, the ladies who come to you after being assaulted, um, they also come to you as a cry for help. So you need to be aware of this. You need to be in tune with your patients as GPs to see what's really happening beyond just the injury. If there's a problem at home, you need to be able to help them to address it. Um, literally, again, so the single link, Kanapale in the Gahana Dianaka is not just a figure of speech. It actually happens. When you slap somebody hard enough, it's going to be very hard. Even school children come with this. You get slapped fairly hard, uh, with, with a fair amount of force. The um, 
palm of your hand closes the your canal and moves a column of air like a bullet into your tympanic membrane rupturing what you see here is a traumatic tympanic membrane rupture have a good look at this because i want you to be able to compare this and differentiate this between a infective tympanic membrane perforation because traumatic ruptures like i said again from a legal point of view are very important also they will heal by themselves if there are no other comorbid conditions these are going to heal by themselves look at the shape of this uh, tympanic membrane rupture it starts from the handle of malleus in the center the center point and it reaches out radial it's like a wedge of it's like a slice of cake or a slice of cheese it's it's a, it's in the shape of a slice and there's a flap of tympanic membrane that has fallen inside and it it has this radially outward spreading wedge shape compare this with the uh, tympanic membrane um, adhabia compare this with this picture which is a infective perforation infective perforations have been there around for months and months and they are they are they are circular they don't originate outwards from the handle of malleus from the center of the tympanic membrane they are simple circles and sometimes the entire tympanic membrane can be lost from a infective perforation so back to the traumatic perforation as you can see uh, we do nothing for this medical but we have to do a lot for this from the patient's point of view humanitarian wise as well as uh, medical legal because again um, tympanic membrane rupture is a uh, is grievous hurt as tiny as this injury is please excuse the chun pang guy outside my door is not take a while and uh, serenade you with furly is until he goes i'm sure you can hear that um so yeah um as i was saying it's grievous hurt uh, uh, impairment of hearing impairment of sight any any impairment of one of your five senses from an injury is grievous hurt or barapatala hani and this means that the person who injured the assaulter should be in remand ideally until this is settled this is the gravity of uh, slapping someone hard enough to rupture their tympanic membrane treatment wise like i said um nothing to be done absolutely nothing to be done please don't put ear drops into these ears and 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 make things worse we get enough gps who put ear drops gondara gentamice indala teclom indala probita dala apitenawa the 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 liquid suspensions in those ear drops are enough to harbor an infection and make things worse so keep them dry the uh, flap of the tympanic membrane that broke off will fall back into place and heal itself and uh, review the patients every 6 weeks by the second visit i can guarantee you 9 to 95% of these would have healed by themselves if they haven't healed after about 6 months even then send to an ent clinic we will uh, we will figure out the rest we will think of maybe doing a surgery and closing off the ear uh, as as required right Hold on a second. Right. Next, we we'll go to um, the infections of the ear and throat. Um. So infections can be in your, the common response you see in your in your pinna, the the ear lobe, or the external ear canal, and the middle ear. That's what we classify these as. So if you take your pinna again, one of the commonest things you see is perichondritis. Perichondritis is inflammation of the cartilage of the ear, and this is common in people who pierce their ears. Um, so piercings, what we advise is stick to the the ear lobe, the bottom bit where there's no cartilage. Please leave your cartilage alone. Any part of the body that anyone's going to pierce, my only advice to them is just stop abusing your cartilage. This is what happens if you pierce your cartilage. um this needs treatment you can simply go with um a broad spectrum antibiotic you can go with either augmentin or even ciprofloxacin and flagyl you can use either one of those either augmentin by itself or ciprofloxacin combination for a week and this should settle you can also give a course of steroids maybe medixon or even prednisolone for about 3 to 5 days to help settle this infection and the inflammation be mindful of the patient's diabetic status by by when giving steroids and also can give some painkillers and ask the patient to keep ice on the on on the ear lobe so that the inflammation and the pain will reduce if it's not settling by day 5 send to us again because then the patient will need iv antibiotics again if it goes on for a week or two perichondritis can can cause the cauliflower ear deformity that the cartilage of the ear canal gets deformed 
There you go. That is your cauliflower ear or the boxer ear. Boxers have this very common view. Next, we'll deal with the external. The, this is um, the next the external ear canal, the common infections of the external ear canal. And um, I want you to first see what a normal ear canal looks like. The canal itself is quite pink and almost pinkish white. And um, there is no information, there is no evidence of any sort of pathology at all in this slide. Compare this with otitis externa. Here, as you can see, the lumen of the canal is narrowed. The, 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 the surfaces are inflamed and it is, um, there's exudate that, that has collected. You can barely see the tympanic membrane beyond this. And even inserting the, auto, the, the, the oroscope speculum will be painful for the patient. Now, when treating this, sorry, let me go back to that. Otitis external treatment, again, is very simple. You go with antibiotics, like I said, and the augmenting, or you can sleep with the cipro and flagyl combination orally. And beyond that, depending on the level of inflammation of the ear canal, we have two choices. One is you can simply go with ear drops. You can go with, um, we prefer a steroid and antibiotic combination. That is, you can combine gentamicin with, um, uh, beta methasone, pro beta and gentamicin combination, or you can even use beclomethasone and gentamicin. Combine the airdrops, ask the patients to alternate between the two, two, two drops for about a week. This is settled. But if, the, if there is significant canal edema, what I mean by significant canal edema is if it's difficult, is in, as in this case right here, if it is difficult for you to see the tympanic membrane beyond, and, it's got, and there's a lot, the patient is in severe pain and distress, then we need to keep some medicine in situ so that it can slowly absorb into the ear canal and sort out the inflammation. For this purpose, we use an ear wick. Very simple, pahanakadana pahantiriyak we cut out wicks about two to three inches long. We coat them in a steroid cream. Commonly, we use tetracot, tetracycline hydrocortisone combination, beclomine, beclomethasone neomycin combination. Uh, tetracot or beclomine is what we commonly use. Coat it, thoroughly cover it, um, and insert the wick gently into the ear canal and leave it there for about three days. On top of the wick, you can ask the patient to put um, a steroid ear drop, like again, like probita, beta sol, um, beclomine, beclomine, five or six drops thrice a day just to soak the uh, wick so that it can slowly elucidate the uh, drug and have the ear canal absorb it and the inflammation to settle. Remove the wick in three days and have a look at how things are. I guarantee you a majority of these patients would have settled. If they haven't settled in three days' time, do send to us to have a look. Now, um, the role of oral antibiotics is very minimal. If it's a severe infection, yes, you can go ahead and give it. But um, mostly, um, um, <clears throat> only about 2 to 3% of the oral antibiotic reaches the ear. So it's much better to put an ear wick or an ear drop, and that will be much more effective. Uh, Nihal has asked whether for an acute hematoma of the earlobe, can we aspirate? Yes, this is a very good question. I haven't covered uh, seromas, seromas and uh, clots of the ear. Hematomas, the problem is, yes, the aspiration part is easy, but the issue here is they fill up again. And that is where we need to deal with this very, very, very um, 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 carefully. Because what we do, ideally, I would suggest you send to an ENT center, a tertiary care hospital. Uh, because uh, when we drain a seroma or a hematoma of the ear, um, to prevent it from filling up again, we, we cut two pieces of plastic. We commonly take a piece of plastic from a used uh, saline bottle, we sterilize it, and we cut a small uh, piece of plastic, two pieces of plastic splints in the shape of the ear. And after we fully empty the seroma, we sandwich the ear from top and bottom with these two plastic splints. They've been cut into the ears, the helix, the shape of the helix and the anti-helix. It's a bit of an intricate process to cut that. And then we suture it tightly so that um, it won't fill up again. And we leave these, they leave the ear sandwiched with, with, between these two splints for a week. Previously, we used to not use a splint. We used to actually uh, tightly bandage this ear with gauze and put a gauze around the patient's head. But Practically, it's difficult for the patient to keep a ghost tied around the head because they can't go to work looking like that. And also, um, it comes off more often than not. So what we do now is a splinting. So for that, I'd prefer it if you can send it because if it fills up again, 
you are you are going to have a risk of perichondritis developing from that and a ear deformity also cauliflower ear like i showed you from that so ideally hematoma sent to us we will sort things out for you and it will be it will look bad on you when the patient comes back to you with a refilled hematoma and they might lose their faith in you so that's why i said again uh the point where you so i want you all to understand the point of reference and do not have any qualms don't feel bad at all for referring a patient to us because if we they come to collegeville i take full responsibility for who, 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 whoever you send whenever i do a lecture i end up with a dozen calls saying i'm sending a patient i always send back with a back referral to after 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 you done what you've done and the patient will appreciate you for understanding that that you are handed him over to a to a tertiary care center and they actually looked up properly they come back to you and thank you okay moving on i'm running out of time um let's see of course middle ear infections is another topic completely by itself i would actually like to discuss this on another day what i will actually go for is nasal polyps uh nasal obstruction this is very important i just run through this um if i get time again i cover middle ear infections separately because that's a very very vast broad topic so let's quickly just go through nasal obstruction i'd like to discuss the causes of nasal obstruction at three levels in life at 5 years at 25 years and at 45 years let's just go through this um the because the history is in it look for the, the ask for the the symptoms and signs you need to look for all differ at these various ages So let's take five years first. Uh, the commonest cause for nasal obstruction at the age of five to ten, I'd say, is adenoid hypertrophy. Now, adenoids are something we very, very commonly miss, and I have seen so many. I think, I mean, I, I'm, I think I'm developing a knack for for, for for detecting adenoids because I've sent a lot of my friends' kids into surgery to have them removed. I'm counting up to number seven now, simply because this is commonly missed by a lot of people. Um, these patients may not actually come to you with nasal obstruction they may come to you saying the mother will come saying um doctor baba nida ganna re hama disama kateng husma ganna kata arage ninne mya mya gora wana sadyen gora wana e wage they will have symptoms like that um or the even if they come for something else you can always look at a child like this look for what we call adenoid facies or the adenoid face this is very important they have a narrow face they have a receiving they have uh, the, the lower jaw there's a there's an overbite the upper jaw is forward the lower jaw is backwards they'll have their mouth open their front teeth will be visible and they look like they look like little squirrels or chipmunks and uh, they can't close their mouth they can't close their mouth when they eat when they chew when they they can't close their mouth they breathe through their mouth their voice sounds very nasal we call that rhinolalia the nasal voice and they may even have uh, bags under their eyes they 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 parents will complain they fall asleep they are are kamali dawal rida ganava ra herala goravanava they are performing badly in school attention span is uh, you know affected the parents may even have gone to the length of looking for restorative dentistry for these children's tooth issues without ever once having been told or having been educated about the option of exploring the adenoids This is how important adenoids are, and this is how easily they can be missed. Like I said, my I have sent my seventh friend's child into surgery to have we have them removed, and the previous six have shown remarkable the remarkable results post surgery because adenoids once removed, the re, the the recovery is miraculous. Right. Let me just run through you quite quickly. Ah, uh, where this is, your adenoid tonsil is behind your soft palate, and when it gets enlarged. what happens is it um, sorry hold on there we are see on the x ray uh, the a is marked what is marked as a is your adenoid tonsil and see how much it has grown into the air and obstructed the air passage the black the black uh, tube you see there is the air passage and um, the entire air passage of this child is obstructed so when they lie down to sleep the soft palate falls on onto the onto onto the uh, the tissue here and obstructs breathing and they start snoring snoring cuts off oxygen to the brain and yeah at this age you can imagine the amount of damage that does because brain development gets affected because of hypoxia at night so adenoids can be very simply treated you can take a x ray post nasal sinus x ray this is not a paranasal sinus x ray this is a post nasal sinus x ray also you can write lateral view 
and always write your suspicions to the extra technician and tell them tell the parents make a mess moon a pattern gun next day in kids we can't be taking a number of x-rays very commonly this x-ray is mistaken so please tell them moon a pattern gun next day and the parents will also look into it you can also see the teeth in this x-ray you can see the overbite and how much the adenoid tissue has pushed the upper jaw forward the minute these adenoids are treated these teeth start receding so i quickly go with treatment for adenoids simple treatment is um we need to treat for about 3 months with a steroid nasal drop and antihistamines either orally i mean yeah sorry uh, oral antihistamines and a muscle stabilizer kids safe safest thing you can go with cetirizin and montelitrast as well as uh, probita nasal drops 3 months take an x ray at the start take an x ray at the end of 3 months ask the parents to keep an eye on all these symptoms i just mentioned above your mother is the patient's mother is the best source of information of a child's issue no matter how ridiculous it sounds listen to the mother they know best um it is up to us to filter what they say medically and get out the proper information but they will know what's going on if there is improvement you will also see in those three months the teeth start receding there is is improvement continue treatment for a further six months or so if there is no improvement after three months consider surgery send to us we will do an adenoidectomy and remove this immediately within two weeks those teeth will go back to their normal state and the patients and the pair and like i said miraculous improvement will be seen once you remove the adenoids all those symptoms will subside right hold on then i'll go for 25 years common issues at 25 years is a for nasal obstruction the common issue you see at 25 years is septal deviation septal deviation is simply the nasal septum tends to deviate or grow to either the left or the right side as you can see here this is because of the skull the, the, the rate of the growth of the various bones of the skull it is not a disease it is simply something we are all born with 80% of people including myself have a septal deviation uh, a deviated septum may not always show on your face as a deviated nose um but if really it does if so that needs reconstructive surgery but the problem with the deviated septum is that they go as you can see in this picture the deviated septum goes and rests upon your turbinates inside the nose and this constant contact and friction can cause nasal obstruction it can cause allergic rhinitis symptoms similar to that uh, constant nasal obstruction sinus issues um post nasal drip uh, headaches things like that so we need to treat them symptomatically you need to just to see simply treat the obstruction you relieve nasal obstruction simply by uh, you can you can always uh, treat these patients as i said treat the symptoms first and you see how things progress assess them for about 3 to 6 months with treatment you can always go with a nasal deepen digestion drop coupled with a steroid drop and uh, antihistamines you can add a course of steroids if the obstruction is severe but that is always uh, debatable i i only go with steroids if i think there are nasal polyps from 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 rhinitis or if the obstruction is severe to the point where the patient can't breathe so we first try to relieve the obstruction and once the initial obstruction has been relieved we maintain the relief by giving them a nasal spray like avamis budesonide betamethasone nasal spray as a puff for night for about 6 months to 1 year if they can be maintained on nasal spray well and good if they can't you can always take this call after about 3 to 4 months if the treatment is not causing any improvement or even if after treatment they revert back to their old block then of course you need to think of surgery send to us we will do the we we, we will do the need for a word about nasal behavior i just saw that's a severe anterior septal deviation you can always see that the columella at the bottom is not in the middle of the nose it is shifted to the right and the left half of the nose is completely obstructed from the deviated septum a word about nasal decongestants um we have a number of them in the brand afrin decon nasibion uh, remember they they give you immediate relief you very common you can use these in patients with nasal polyps with nasal obstruction allergic rhinitis yes they give immediate relief but remember the rule of golden rule of thumb 7 days two drops to either side twice a day for 7 days and stop stop for a month you repeat nasal decongestants only after one month do not use them for months and months a lot of pharmacists press press type this patients also need to take it on their own empirically because it gives good relief but 
abusing nasal decongestants can lead to a condition called rhinitis medicamentosa or medically induced rhinitis. So that is a huge problem. Try to avoid that. Please advise the patients that despite uh, Decon and Nasirion giving immediate relief, please don't use it like cocaine. Hold on. So at 45 years, the commonest cause for nasal obstruction can be nasal polyps. Now polyps, here we are, can be um, commonly, commonest cause for polyps is allergic rhinitis or cata or penis. Hair. Simply, um, it's a dust allergy. It is just the form of asthma. It's the same disease as asthma, very allergic to dust. And your nasal mucosa becomes hyperreactive, starts secreting excessively and starts growing out in polypoidal shapes. So we need to be able to identify a polyp from a nasal turbinate. Turbinates, all of us have in our nose, but polyps grow on top of the turbinates and they can appear as a turbinate, but we as GPs have to be able to identify the difference between these two. Here you see a polyp. A polyp is always, uh, we call it translucent. It's semi-transparent. It has uh, tiny blood vessels on top of it. It's very colorless, whitish colorless, semi-transparent, fleshy, blobby mass. And that is what a polyp looks like. Um, as opposed to, there we are. Now you can see this actually is a better picture. What you see in the center is a nasal polyp, as I described. And what you see on your on your left hand side is a turbulence, the inferior and the middle turbulence. Look at the color of those, those are more pink. They are hard, they're not shiny. And on your right hand side, you see the nasal septum. It's a polyp sandwich between the septum and the turbulence. <clears throat> so like I said, polyps, the commonest causes for, I'll get back to this. The commonest cause of polyps is allergic rhinitis or cata. So cata, like I said, we can treat, treat the allergy, control the allergy, chase this with um, 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 nasal decongestants and steroid nasal drops, oral antihistamines, oral muscle stabilizers, steroids. Yes, if the symptoms are severe, antibiotics only if you see signs of sinusitis on top of this because these can block your sinuses. Um, and Treat for three months. If the patient improves, then give them a maintenance dose of a steroid spray for about six months. If they don't improve for three months, send to us. Now, the take home message from nasal polyps, very, very importantly, is this allergic polyps are always, always bilateral. Look in both sides of the nose and you will see them on both sides. If you can't see them on both sides, send them to us because unilateral polyps are dangerous. They can be due to nasopharyngeal carcinoma. They can be what you call an anthrocoanal polyp. An anthrocoanal polyp is a large word simply describing a polyp that arises from the maxillary sinus, the maxillary antrum. And that is a different polyp type of polyp altogether. It could be malignant. So if you see a polyp only on one side of the nose, refer to us. If you see them on both sides, yes, you can treat. You are justified treating. And then repeating, seeing the patient after three months' time. So um, the commonest investigation that we do for this is your x-ray sinus view. And you can see here that uh, the left maxillary sinus is completely obstructed. We do to a polyp in the left side of the nasal cavity, obstructing its outlet. The right sinus also has a bit of mucosal inflammation, but it's largely empty compared to the left side. So uh, these are common patients, the patients you can easily treat. Uh, so one example I give when I treat, when I, when I lecture my uh, NCGP candidates is that, oh, when I, I'm someone who champions for GPs, I'm someone who champions for primary care. And uh, Sri Lankan health-seeking behavior is on its head. We all uh, have specialists at our beck and call. That shouldn't be the case because um, the layman shouldn't be able to choose a specialist of his or her own liking and self-diagnose and go to a specialist because you're wasting your money and time as well as the specialist money and time and you're not uh, utilizing a primary health care which is what you should be going for all of us should be having a family doctor put this into your patient's heads your family doctor is your king thing when it comes to disease common example i always give is um, you know when i have when you think of our non-medical friends and, and our families when they have a headache they'll say ask uh, i have a headache who is the best neurosurgeon to me they will go to a neurosurgeon, neurosurgeon will, um, you know, then they'll find the best neurosurgeon, mind you, and go, and then they will do an, there will be an MRI done, a CT scan, a various other tests, and the neurosurgeon, to his depth of knowledge, will in investigate this patient for this headache, and come, and the patient come back and say, everything is normal, MRI, normal CT, normal, all good, right? But he found some phlegm in my sinuses, and he sent to my friend, the ENTC. 
So the ENT surgeon will then treat, maybe do further testing, surgery, whatnot. And you end up spending about half a million to get treated for sinusitis. Something that your GP could have done for you with this X-ray, which would not have cost you even a thousand five hundred dollars, right? So this is the importance of primary care. This is the this is the message that we need to give to your patients when you act as GPs. You need to champion for your GPs too. There are yes, we need specialists, but specialists should be accessed through a GP. That is the proper system. That is how it happens in the UK, in Australia, in any proper system. That is how it happens because patients should not be self-diagnosed themselves and. Because you're just wasting everyone's time by, 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 by going ahead and doing that. So remember, this, the reason I put this X-ray also is that was a very, very common issue that is faced by um, GPs as a whole. So I'll actually break my lecture here because I've just gone beyond one hour. There's a few more things that I cover. Maybe we can do it some other day. But for now, I hope, I'm sorry for rushing through one. I do talk fast, my apologies. It's been that way since day one. Um, and uh, I, I had to cover a huge content load within the space of one hour. I hope that was good. Uh, Lakna, yes, uh, the, the, the good question, the duration of nasal and decongestion, like I said, one week. One week, stop for three weeks. Then again, one week, stop for three weeks. Never more than a week at one point, and after a week, stop for a month. And if you get a patient who's used it for months and months, stop completely, just go with nasal steroids and no uh, nasal decongestants until we have sorted out their issues. Right, um, any other questions, uh, please feel free to email me. You have my contact and get my contact from the College of GPs. I'm always here, any ENT issues, you, you want to refer any ENT patients to Kalugovila, drop me a text, send me an email, just inform me prior and send them. I will sort them out to the best of my knowledge for as long as I'm there. I'll be, I'm always here for you. Any primary care questions, any issues you have with regards to ENT or with regards to, with regards to primary health care, we're always here for you. In my capacity as the Secretary of the NCGP Board, I can always say we're always here for you. Please reach out and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for such an informative lecture, Dr. Sumit. I think, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for the such an informative lecture. We learned a lot. I hope everyone so. So if there's no other questions, we can conclude the session, I think. Thank you very much, sir. It's a very informative lecture. Thank you very much. So we conclude the session, no? Right. Anything else?